then I'm going to go ahead and get started. It looks like we have a really good turnout. I want to welcome everybody to the kickoff for the um, of the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health monthly lecture series um, for academic year 2022 and 23. And we're uh, I'm just delighted that we're kicking it off with Steve Shoptaw, a professor from UCLA who's going to give a, a lecture on contingency management. And uh, I promise you this will be an outstanding lecture. I've known Steve for many years and he does terrific work. Um, but I want to also mention that this is kicking off a theme. So contingency management is also going to be the focus of this year's uh, VCBH annual conference on October 6th and 7th. So I hope those in the audience who are interested and have the uh, time will join us for that session as well. You can join um, in person or remotely. And uh, we've been sending out uh, email uh, ads about, about that. So feel free if you need more information to reach out to us. So I don't want to steal any more time from Steve from his lecture, but um, Rick Ross and Steve's longtime UCLA um, <laughs> collaborator and friend is now a member of the VCBH. So I've asked Rick if he would do a, an introduction for Steve. So uh, Thanks to everybody for being uh, in the session. And I look forward to Steve's uh, talk. So Rick? Yes, well, it's a, a great uh, pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Steve, um, who's my longtime friend and colleague. I went through his stuff to put together an introduction and it really is a bit overwhelming. So uh, Steve, I apologize if I uh, forget any of the various things you're doing. Steve is a professor, he's a UCLA graduate, um, professor uh, in the Department of Family Medicine and Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. He's the director of the Center for Behavior and Addiction Medicine uh, at UCLA. He has, um, uh, one of the things he did that I always was tremendously uh, appreciative of was he set up an organization called Safe House which was one of the first real harm reduction oriented facilities in Los Angeles. Steve really brought the concept of harm reduction in working with people with substance use uh, to the, the Los Angeles community. Um, his work on HIV and methamphetamine and men who have sex with men has been really, I think probably, he's done a lot of stuff, but that's been a theme that's gone on ever since I've known him. When he started working with me, it was clear that was going to be his area. And it actually has a bit of a, a roots in, at the University of Vermont in that the protocol we used at UCLA and all the work, including Steve's, was uh, Higgins's uh, uh, original protocol and his work. So there is a link to the University of Vermont. Steve does uh, work on medication development. Uh, he does international work in South Africa and Vietnam and blah, 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 a bunch of other stuff. But I know one of the things that is really uh, significant recently is he is now the editor in chief of drug and alcohol dependence, uh, which I'm sure is gonna be a big job for him uh, going forward. Uh, his talk today is contingency management, HIV, and men who have sex with men, uh, current status. And with great pleasure, I introduce my colleague and friend, Steve Shopta. Thanks, Rick. This really does take me back. I, I, I appreciate all the kind words and Safe House is probably my best capstone uh, achievement in the career. It really is an amazing thing. Um, it's a whole other story, but uh, but it's also good. I remember the first time I met you and Steve Higgins was 1991 at a at a P50 meeting in some place, probably DC, and it was like it's we've been working side by side ever since. So this is a it is part of the family, and it's great to be here. Thanks for asking me. So let's see here. I'm going to bring up my slides. Okay. So here are my disclosures. Today we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we're not going to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk a lot about the epidemiology of stimulant use in communities of men who have sex with men, uh, men who have sex with men and women, and others, uh, gay and bisexual men, behaving men. We're going to talk about factors of culture, we're going to talk about links to infectious diseases, 
And then we're going to talk about contingency management, because what Rick was saying is really important. In Los Angeles, we, I started with, started with the drug studying methamphetamine, and among um, methamphetamine users, people who use methamphetamine in Los Angeles, among men who have sex with men, it is the primary, methamphetamine is the primary driver of HIV. So that's the link that started uh, in, you know, where I started to work. We're gonna talk about how it works in treatment settings, and we're gonna talk about the limits of CM efficacy when looking at harm reduction and prevention settings. That has all kinds of implications. We're gonna talk about contingency management in infectious diseases, including HIV and MSM. And then we're gonna talk about the potential next steps for CM research in MSM and infectious diseases. This is um, a paper from the Lancet that was led by Michael Farrell. And I actually got to participate in this process um, in, in looking at, uh, it's, the, it's the most comprehensive review on methamphetamine that's out there. It's still pretty current. It's a few years old now, but um, the, the extensiveness of those, that Africa, uh, I'm sorry, the Australia group in doing these kinds of reviews is profound. And here we see that, you know, the great, about 5% currently of the Australian population, maybe it's four now, is, is using methamphetamine on any given day in a year's time. But other places in the world where it's popular, Southeast Asia, Western Europe, and of course, US. Um, when we look at just the rate of people who, the number of people who are using methamphetamine in the U.S., it's low. Um, Joey Palomar published these data showing that it's less than 1%. It's actually 0.07, it's 0.7% in the general population. But when you look at separate groups, you see higher rates, and those include people who are using heroin and, and um, LSD compared to the full sample. So methamphetamine is popular. This makes some sense. We've heard a lot about fentanyl and, and, and uh, methamphetamine being co-used in places where it wasn't before, like the hollers of West Virginia and also the Northeast Corridor. Um, but I, I think I, I will leave you uh, with a little bit of homework here. This is a really important paper by Peter Ruder and his group in Maryland talking about how national survey data really has a problem when trying to understand um, uh, uh, surveys of prevalence of substance use within subgroups um, based upon the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. It's really worth downloading and reading, especially if um, uh, for, for faculty to assign to your juniors. Um, in LA County, what we see, we see that where I work was we see this methamphetamine growth and you can see over the last decade, uh, methamphetamine here is the um, yellow bars and you can see from the beginning of the 2010s to 2020 with this incredibly large um, year over year increase of folks who are dying from methamphetamine use. And when you look at uh, methamphetamine and um, the, the co-use with uh, synthetic opioids, fentanyl, that's the green bars. You can see that this is just going, it's, it's just going crazy here, doubling year over year here. Um, um, and you know the data now are that uh, there are six people dying in LA County every day to drug overdose, uh, and five of them are either from methamphetamine, fentanyl, or their combination. It's just hor we, we have a horrible problem going on here. We also see that methamphetamine is linked with sexual behavior, particularly in men uh, who have sex with men with high rates of uh, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and also just in general, um, methamphetamine corresponds with um, high rates of uh, STDs as well in the general population. Um, I think one of the things that sort of has been historical is just knowing how syphilis, methamphetamine, and HIV kind of are co-located. And these, this is a heat map here of, uh, I'm going to spend just a little time talking about the epidemiology to give you a sense of why I do this work. Um, and you can see here that uh, blue is a small cluster, green is a medium-sized cl cluster, and orange-red is a big cluster in terms of HIV new diagnoses here um, from 2018 to 2020. This is before the um, COVID uh, pandemic, so you can see this, this is the downtown area. This is the Figueroa Corridor, where a lot of African-American and Latino folks live. Um, Co-located co with this 18% of these cases had histories of methamphetamine use, 11% were unhoused, 66 
percent reported anonymous sex partners and almost half, 49% had co-infection with syphilis. So a take home from today is where you see syphilis, you will see HIV. So, so this is a, a problem. I know that there's a discussion going on right now about paying attention to sexually transmitted diseases in the country right now. It's really important. Our, our surveillance systems have been dismantled or disengaged by COVID. Um, and so we don't know where we are in terms of syphilis and HIV in most parts of the country. Um, and what I do know is that we're probably in a world of hurt. The latest data estimating gay and bisexual men um, compared to heterosexual men and substance use shows that for almost all substance use or substance use disorders, gay and bisexual men tend to have higher prevalence than uh, significantly higher prevalence than gay than heterosexual men. Um, and uh, you can look at this later, um, and, but here we can see for methamphetamine, it's almost a three times uh, difference between um, heterosexual men and um, um, uh, gay and bisexual men. Um, in cocaine, it's, uh, it's a little over twice. So cocaine is about twice as popular as methamphetamine, but methamphetamine has a more concentrated um, um, methamphetamine use disorder is more concentrated in uh, men who have sex with gay bisexual men. And what we also see is that this is something that's happening. We saw that in Western Europe, these are data fresh off the, um, uh, the, the, the Google showing that addiction, uh, in addiction that uh, men who have sex with men in a cohort in, in the Netherlands are very um, active in their use and with increasing use of amphetamine and methamphetamine. That's the green and blue bars here. Um, and this is the, the proportion of folks and this is the odds that they're using the behavior. Um, and you can see the highest rate is poppers and then the green bar here is erectile dysfunction drugs. I'm going to leave that as a point because that leads to a number of different things that we'll be talking about today, and that's the sexualized drug use aspect of um, methamphetamine um, with uh, folks who are out there. And just finally, just to point out that this is not just gay white men. This is a report that's new from, um, from Baltimore showing that Black men who have sex with men are four times, four and a half times more likely to have HIV prevalence and two and a half times more likely to have um, syphilis um, if they're using methamphetamine. Um, and this is from um, a, a study of 268 gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in, in Baltimore. So, so really showing that around the country, around the world, this link between um, drug use and particularly methamphetamine use and um, sex uh, and infectious diseases is going on. So. As Rick was talking about, I've been doing this work for a long time. And one of the first things we didn't know when we first started doing this work in the early 90s was that crystal, that link between crystal methamphetamine, behaviorally acting gay and bisexual men and other men who have sex with men um, touched almost at every aspect of the men it, in terms of intimacy, the physical and psychological energy, the drug of the moment, it led to parties um, cultural identification, gay men identify by having sex with other men. So this drug came in and shifted not only about how men were thinking about themselves sexually, but also about how they think of themselves culturally. So it was really a bunch of uh, ideas in that way. It intensified sex experiences. It led to connections with other men. It, it, it linked to HIV, which in 1996, when we started doing this work, we, we didn't understand so much about how you treat HIV. And when methamphetamine was just out there among gay men, um, when, when the new medications would come on board, uh, I would go to meetings and we would hear doctors tell us that they, because gay men were unreliable, that they would be last in line to have access to the medications to treat and eventually um, be able to manage HIV as well as it does right now. It's no longer the case, thank God, but that's where we started. Um, and of course, gay was always a piece of this. Um, so one of the things I often hear is, you know, well, how is it different today than it was in 1995 and 1996? This is a um, ethnography that was written by Kathy Reback back in 1990 
97, it was published then, the data were collected in 95 and 96. The co social construction of a gay drug, I leave you the link here to be able to download it. Um, and, and as Nora Volkoff said, we don't need any more uh, research on contingency management. We don't need any more qualitative studies on the place of uh, methamphetamine in the lives of gay and bisexual men. We understand how this works. It's the same today as it was in 1997. So I always point people back to what we learned from the early days when we when colleagues were out there trying to figure out what these links were about and how it worked. Because it was more than just a drug or sex or a community. It was like this confluence of things that were going on. And to be able to intervene really required having some competency with the community. Um, in the beginning, people who were like from UCLA, who were professors, we were not trusted. We were seen as outsiders. And this is the way the community captured the ways in which uh, methamphetamine, sex, and drug, act, methamphetamine, sex, and potentially HIV um, was co-related in the same moment. And this says, I was so tweaked, which is an old timey word for uh, high on meth, that I didn't care how he screwed me. And um, it still is, a, this is from a community-based agency that they used in, uh, uh, in early data. And it, what we now call this is chemsex. Um, you can look at this later. It's, it's this whole thing. And we've been able to document that sex while on methamphetamine among gay and bisexual men is not just sex on drug. It's actually something uniquely different. It allows people to experience their bodies and themselves in a way that's different, say, than when they're not using methamphetamine. I like to think of it how that when you take cocaine and alcohol and you have them together in the same body at the same time, you know, it, the, the, the cocaine plus alcohol makes cocaethylene, which is its own sort of uh, psychoactive chemical um, with its own subjective effects. And, and that's how I kind of think about chemsex, that this is something that happens for a significant proportion of men who have sex with men. And in a, in a, day, in a, in a, in a review of MSM papers over the past 30 years, uh, Maxwell points out that it's about three to 29%. So it's about a third of men who will actually report these behaviors. So, so, but it also is the case that if you pull methamphetamine out of the behavior repertoire, then you have a man who has sex with other men who is missing a particular kind of sex. It's not like he's not able to have sex, but he's not able to have a particular kind of sex. And so, as we know as behaviors, that that's an important point. And we begin to think about how we think about recovery, about how to get people to sustain abstinence from methamphetamine and to be able to think about the whole person as they're doing that and think about that extensive behavioral repertoire and thinking about how to um, address those issues. That's been something that's been a, an important part of what we've been doing. And what we learned was that there are specific behavioral phenotypes among men who have sex with men. Um, and we the most popular is called the weekend warriors. These are behaviorally men, largely working class men, uh, blue collar, white collar, whatever, but they got jobs and they, they start using maybe a Thursday night. You know, methamphetamine has a long half-life, nine to 12 hours. So they start the party on Thursday night, they dose again on Friday, maybe they're sick at work and they don't show up. And then on Friday night, they start using erectile dysfunction drugs. One of the first things we learned out in the field was that gay and bisexual men who are using a lot of methamphetamine, and this is one of the first papers written by a junior of mine, have a condition called crystal dick, which is when you can't get an erection because um, it, it, the, 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 the crystal methamphetamine is preventing the, the, the parasympathetic system to be able to, to work as it should to be able to pro provide the erection. Around 2000, 2005, we have the development of the erectile dysfunction drugs, and the, these are actually packaged now with party invitations um, so that men receive a party invitation for a weekend and they send the blue pills um, in the mail uh, or with the, with the invitation so that the implication is clear that, that you can actually take care of the, uh, the uh, adverse event from using so much methamphetamine. Dose again on Saturday, Saturday night, the party continues. You smoke out on Sunday morning, some benzos in the afternoon, and you slide into work Monday or Tuesday. 
It's about 100 to 150 dollars for the weekend. Um, lowest costs are in LA, the highest in Miami. Um, this is what it looks like to be a shift worker, somebody who needs to work two jobs a day to be able to pay the rent. Um, this is a different kind of use of methamphetamine, and you can see that you know regularly dosing your brain twice a day, three times a day with methamphetamine, whether it's injection or smoked, it's very efficient at getting into the bloodstream, and it's very potent leads to a high cumulative dose. Here's what the once in a blue moon kind of guy looks like. These are also folks that are out there at a significant rate, not as much as it used to be as they used to be because they would, people in the community would say to me, hey, Steve, I can do this. I can do this on a weekend and it's not a problem. You know, I now use the sort of matrix um, analogy of Neo, you know, are you the, are, are you know, are you the one, Neo? You might be the one, but really, are you the one? That's, that's kind of the comeback to folks, because what I've seen is that the blue moon becomes the weekend warrior, um, and um, it generally, that's when you start having the negative consequences that lead to uh, diagnosing uh, addiction. So, I, I, as a behaviorist, though, I think it's important to think about uh, the cumulative exposure of methamphetamine to the brain over a particular, uh, over each month. And when you think about it, there's a significant difference in dosing of brain to the weekend warriors, to the shift workers, and to the blue moon guys. Um, this is important because we know that different levels of methamphetamine in brain now cause different neurobiological adaptations and actual changes within, uh, within neurons and how they work and fire. So, so this is an important point. It's also, it, it, it actually changed my thinking in how to think about people and their their phenotypic use of this drug and what that's happening to brain. As a behaviorist, I believe that every behavior is based in brain. Every single behavior comes from a set of neurons firing in a particular way, whether it's using methamphetamine, whether it's having dinner, going to bed at night. All those behaviors are driven by neurons. And when you have this exposure of neurons to methamphetamine, a very potent stimulus, at a very high frequency over a period of time, we would expect to see differences of outcomes. And in fact, I'm gonna show you some data that that is indeed the case. Um, we also see behaviorally, there are differences in the naturally occurring abstinence that can, be, can, can actually tell us how people might respond to contingency management, where people who are weekend warriors have you know, two weeks or so of naturally occurring abstinence, whereas shift workers may have a small number of days in a month where they have where they don't use, whereas the blue moon guys have substantial periods of use. And one of the questions, this paper, um, oh gosh, I didn't put the link on this. This is published in March this year of drug and alcohol dependence. Um, um, I was this I was the lead author on this one, which is kind of rare because I have a lot of juniors now and they they I usually take the end. But I just basically looked and saw we have some cohort data, about 10 years of cohort data of men who have sex with men. Um, and among these, a substantial, about a third are using methamphetamine. It's a sample of 500. Um, and we have different responses. You could do none in a month, monthly or less, or weekly or more. So the circles, the squares, <clears throat> and the diamonds. And the same pattern is seen here with the overlapping confidence intervals between the use groups, but not between the high use and the none for almost every single aspect that we measured here. These are the social consequences of unemployment, housing instability, intimate partner violence, new anal intercourse partner, sexual, concurrent sexual partners, exchange sex, positive STIs, uh, detectable viral loads among people who are living with HIV, renal conditions, neurological conditions, and psychological conditions. So we, what we see is here that not that there is some health benefit, and it's a significant health and social benefit to using less. Why is that important? Because when we're developing contingency management schemes, we are always looking for eliminating methamphetamine use or cocaine use in the 48 hours or 72 hours before they provide the biomarker that shows what they were doing. So one of the things is when I first started working was that I thought we needed to have like complete abstinence. That's no longer how I think. I think what we see is that these are non, this, these data are from men who are not in treatment. These are just guys going around their day using at a particular rate. 
And just in the <clears throat> just in a non-controlled way, we can see that there are social and physical health benefits to using less methamphetamine. An important point. The place where it doesn't hold up is about HIV incidence going from negative to positive. And among men who have sex with men, we see from Project Explore, which is a, a four-year uh, cohort of uh, HIV negative men and measuring how many people turned HIV positive. And then the multi-site AIDS cohort study, which shows, uh, which is a, a cohort study of men from 1988 to current, um, looking at how they did um, as they responded to HIV and AIDS. And what we see is that the attributable fraction of new cases of HIV was 16% in Explore and 32%, 33% in Max, which is outstandingly huge, which leads me to my point and provides the data that when they talk about methamphetamine is the driver of HIV incidence in men who have sex with men. In Los Angeles County, more data showing this is from the Medical Care Coordination. It's a program that helps people who are not virally suppressed to be able to um, have a nurse case manager, a, a social worker, and a um, peer navigator to be able to get uh, virally suppressed. And we see here that the probability of viral suppression decreases to the point they, so they join the program. And then it, you have this nice big rebound. But what we see is that not everybody does the same in terms of being able to move toward viral suppression. And what we see here is that the primary drivers of viral continuing uh, continuous viremia are stimulant use and housing instability. So again, why would that be? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Part of it is not just because people forget to use their medications. We have been studying this mechanism in people living with HIV and people not living with HIV. And we've been able to show that um, methamphetamine recent use causes pro-inflammatory cytokine release in gut. What that means is that if you're virally suppressed, taking your medicines as normal, and you take methamphetamine, it activates the immune system, which means you'll have release of virus in the gut, which is the place where uh, infection can take takes place. So, so the whole idea here is that methamphetamine works against HIV medications, whether they're for care or prevention. So. <clears throat> Fantastic 20 years of work and studying this stuff. Um, but what do we know about contingency management for methamphetamine use in men who have sex with men? In, in, in the late 1990s and 2000s, we started something called Friends Health Center. It was a randomized control trial where we <clears throat> randomized 40 um, gay and bisexual men who have sex with men with methamphetamine use disorder. Um, now it, it was then it was methamphetamine dependence, uh, <clears throat> 40 each to contingency management, the, the Higgins strategy, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which was the matrix model, which was Rick's model, um, uh, strategies for instilling abstinence and preventing relapse, the combined CM plus CBT approach, and a, a gay specific uh, culturally adapted matrix model. <clears throat> what we found was that in, in, it was a 16 week trial, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you can have 48 visits over the period. If we just average the number of negative urine samples over the 48 visits, what we see is that any condition containing um, con, uh, contingency management outperformed cognitive standard cognitive behavioral therapy. And this was the control. Um, <clears throat> what we thought was fascinating here is this contingency management condition was just basically men coming in, peeing, getting a voucher for negative urine, um, and then coming back two days later or three days if it was a Friday to Monday. And that was it. There was no talking about their relationship with their mother, no refer referrals to 12-step. It was really that simple. So it's really measuring. What do you, what do you get when you use contingency management as an, as an intervention by itself with, these, with this population? This was important because it really shifted my world and shifted my way of thinking about how people approach um, uh, response to treatments for addiction. What we also saw at 12 weeks was that all, all treatments performed about the same, 70 to 80%. Um, this, this, this increase in CBT in, in terms of these outcomes at 12 months is called the sleeper effect. And, and Kathy Carroll, God love her, um, and Rick have also written about how this works, and that's a whole other talk, but it's an interesting sort of thing to, to see what happens. But what 
is also interesting is that just having contingency management has a very powerful effect one year later on their on, on people's methamphetamine abstinence levels. Uh, what we also saw was that when you started methamphetamine, any of these treatments, we saw a re massive reduction in unprotected receptive anal intercourse that lasted to one year with a specific potent reduction here in the gay uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which led to a, a whole host of other work. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I work a lot with students. Colby Passaro is one of the smartest that I've worked with. He's an emergency room physician now. Um, he did a follow-up 20 years after this study that I just presented to look and see what happened if people were also cigarette smoking um, and, and correlated, did a two-by-two two of people who smoked, didn't, um, and had HIV and didn't. And what we saw was that the survival rate was greatest for the people who were living with HIV but were non-smokers um, 20 years down the road. But if you were uh, an, living with HIV and a cigarette smoker, you had a, 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 like a four times the rate of, um, of standard mortality um, in, in 20 years. So it was, it was just 16, 17 per 1,000 person years was really ex excessively high and, and led us to remembering that cigarette smoking is a part of the picture to think about. We have, I have the re references here. This is the, the gay specific cognitive behavioral therapy, the matrix model um, that is uh, the, generated from this project and is there. Adam Carrico also pulled on this sort of uh, model to be able to mimic this in, um, in San Francisco. He developed something called Artemis, which is a um, sort of a mindfulness intervention. It allows people to, you can read here about what the different aspects of the Artemis in intervention is, but what he was able to do was to use that with contingency management in people living with HIV and who were using meth. And what he didn't do was to sort of dismantle in the way we did um, the, the talk therapy from the behavioral therapy, but what he was able to show was that the contingency management significantly improved positive affect and mindfulness um, uh, within, within, the, um, uh, within the Artemis condition compared to control. Um, so, eh, you know, it's not as strong as our, our work, but it's, it's another example of showing that contingency management um, can optimize outcomes from otherwise probably non-effective interventions. Um, the community also weighs in and talks about, well, this is all fine and good, Steve, but, you know, this is still, you know, it's, it's out there and it's in, engaging methamphetamine and cocaine is interacting with sex drive. We need to also keep, keep the focus on this. And, and if you're going to pay attention to your data, we have to be able to think about, well, how do we take some of these treatment interventions and move them to harm reduction in MSM? One of the early ones, and it's still out there, is from the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. It's called the Positive Reinforcement Opportunity Project, Project PROP. These are data from early 2000s showing when, when this actually hit the field. Jeff Klausner, who was the head of the public health department in San Francisco at the time, worked with me on this. We put together, it's, a, it's an adaptation of the, of the Higgins model that was downsized in terms of being able to be implemented in a community setting. Um, and the whole idea was, okay, we buy it, Steve, this methamphetamine and um, HIV stuff is really linked. So let's, let's address the methamphetamine side. Let's not just try to fix up what happens as a result of the methamphetamine um, and uh, HIV. Let's, let's try to see if we can reduce um, methamphetamine use and improve health among uh, the men who have sex, gay and bisexual men in, in San Francisco. And what we see here is if you look at this, this looks like the, the Dom de Philippus sort of response when you use contingency management for cocaine or methamphetamine in the VA system. Um, and in 2022, uh, Project Prop is still out there. So this is from their website. I just pulled this up today um, and basically showed that, you know, it's three days a week. So it's now 12 weeks and the $330. So they've reduced the amount that they're paying. But here's the schedule. And this is also the schedule that is used in the Adam Carrico paper. That was the CM 
contingency management that was featured there. Initial voucher with $2, a quarter each for consecutive negatives up to a maximum of $10 with an $8.50 bonus for three consecutive samples, including the rapid reset. So what I think is fascinating is that um, at least on the West Coast, the community groups don't need to be convinced about this and are pulling from dollars that are about disease reduction and harm minimization to be able to push contingency out there and make it sure it's available. Kathy Reback, my colleague, um, also thought, well, what if we try to tweak it and move it toward to uh, contingency management so that gay, bisexual, transgender, non-treatment seeking persons experiencing homelessness might be able to access the benefits. This is the store she built. This was with J uh, Leslie Amos, um, a, an old friend of mine. And you can see here, she did a two by two showing here the average level one scores. These are the points that were earned and you can see the contingency management outperformed the control condition. All participants received points for showing up and being able to participate in different follow-up visits um, with the control group getting no additional points the contingency management group getting extra points for health promoting behaviors and drug and alcohol avoidance behaviors. And you can see here that if you just look at attendance behaviors, there was no difference, but the contingency management condition had substantially many more points compared to the control condition related to their health behaviors, showing that even among people who have little, that contingency management can be used to improve health behaviors. And it, I think it's also just helpful to just see that, you know, some of the things you buy are candy, uh, you know, sodas, uh, socks, things like that, as opposed to maybe a more um, higher SES group that you might be able to think about. Addie Namathy has done a number of studies, but this is one um, using the contingency management schedule among gay and bisexual men um, who are um, out there pretty street involved. Um, uh, again, uh, this is using 250 voucher of the dollar a quarter increase for subsequent ne uh, negatives, a $10 bonus for three consecutives or with a rapid reset and a maximum of 444. And what she's able to show is that um, in the contingency management group, um, they, she, she, everybody got contingency management, one group got standard education and one got nurse case management with the primary outcome being uh, hepatitis B vaccine. And what she was able to show was that um, across groups and conditions uh, that the standard education plus contingency management uh, performed as well as the nurse case management uh, condition and cost substantially less. So one of the things that I like to point out about this is to start thinking about in terms of preparing communities to invest in contingency management with, within their communities is to begin thinking about the cost per participant. And of course, when you have hepatitis B vaccine on board, which many people do now because of the educational system, uh, or used to, I don't know if they still do, but the point being that finding people, getting them vaccinated actually protects against liver transplants later down the road. Um, so one of the questions is among men who have sex, Steve, it works. Okay, this is great. We know contingency management works in treatment. Now it's working in harm reduction. I see that. Well, what about if we take it out to the sexually transmitted infection clinic and evaluate it there? Tim Menza published these data um, of uh, applying contingency management. He was working with Matt Golden in, in, in Seattle, and he started with $2.50 for the first stimulant negative sample, a um, $1.25 increase for the consecutive negatives, uh, $10 maximum, $10 bonus, and this is the total. And this was a 12-week um, uh, uh, week period of contingency management that was um, uh, with six-week six panels here, the six-week visits, one, two, three, four. And basically what we saw was that uh, we he was not able to show an effective contingency management on reducing either methamphetamine or cocaine use among these men who have sex with men who were seeking care for a sexually transmitted infection in Seattle. Um, so first time, this is the, um, my name's attached to this, but I, I am probably the only person aside from the people on this team who've published a negative finding study for contingency management. And here you can see the contingency management versus control showing a significantly more people in the contingency management showed up with um, a stimulant in the urine at week 24 compared to the control. Um, 
by contrast, my colleague, Dr. Rafi Landovitz, did a study of 120 uh, stimulant using MSM, this is both methamphetamine and cocaine, looking to see what happens if you um, incentivize people to come in and participate in non-occupational non post-exposure prophylaxis. So these are men who are using stimulants and have had a condom break or some other sort of interaction experience where uh, their potential exposure to HIV. So again, it's a similar sort of schedule here we see. Um, and, and the design was that half of the participants were assigned to the contingency management schedule and half were yoked to controls. Um, the escalating schedule, um, and we see that uh, the outcomes on methamphetamine use are good, but not like take home. The take home is it's not as dramatic as what we saw in the treatment setting here, nine versus six. But what we did see was that the contingency management compared to the control the control condition, you know, control had substantially and significantly better um, markers of use of the post-exposure prophylaxis, both in terms of adhering to the medication and in terms of completing the course of treatment, both uh, outcomes that you want to see when you're treating HIV or preventing HIV established. So what are the differences here between Los Angeles and Seattle in terms of working with people who are engaged in um, HIV behaviors? Um, well, one of the differences is Menza actually, they tried hard. They went from three times a week visits to twice a week visits, and they still couldn't get it to work. But the difference was that, uh, you know, the, the, the sexually transmitted infection treatment treatment clinic is not a community-based agency. So by coming to the community-based agency, there may be some, uh, some contact feelings that happen or thoughts that people get about changing their, their stimulant use behavior. So whereas the folks at the STI clinic, not interested, the people coming into the community-based agency may be willing to think about it. And the ability to have non-occupational uh, non PEP um, available may have helped people to think about their behavior because the fear and anxiety from going through that potential exposure event um, is, is, is enough to maybe shift thinking. Um, um, but in, as in all studies, responders were less likely to have stimulant positive urine samples at baseline than, than the other folks. Um, and here you can see that people who are responders who had a single positive were significantly more likely to have, uh, um, uh, were, were significantly less likely to have, well, the, the responders were less likely to be positive at baseline. Ken Silverman said, well, this is all very cool, but what if we think about this more broadly, not just men who have sex with men, but applying contingency management to people living with HIV who have ongoing viremia? On the left, we have his data showing that an incentive condition compared to uh, uh, usual care. Now this, we had Ken come out and present on this study out in Los Angeles. It's a fantastic study. He incentivized people $10 every day that they were able to take their ARTs, their antiretroviral therapies. So in a year, he would have $3,650 that he gave to participants. It's a two-year study. So he invested about $7,300 into each of the into the potentially into each of the study participants, and you see this huge difference in the people who responded in the incentive versus the usual care in terms of being able to have undetectable viral load. Fantastic! Our public health department has bit hard on this, and we're working on making that happen in Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> in terms of drug users, I asked the question: What if you pull out the drug users and see if you see the same thing? And the answer is yes, you do. You see significantly more people who are in the incentive condition, um, um, whether they're drug negative or drug positive. Um, so, so that's very cool. And I just represent these data to show that here's what you get. This is the behavior change you get from using contingency management. Here's the behavior that you get, this sort of less good response by not focusing on, um, but by, by not using an incentive approach, but using standard people who talk to you and things like that. So I think that's really an important point. So, okay, so Steve, what's, what's coming up? So Jesse Clark, who is an infectious disease physician who has uh, been bitten by the behavioral science bug, uh, did a small pilot here to test what happens if you were to incentivize people 
on whether they were using drug or whether they were um, able to take their antiretroviral therapies. Um, these are HIV negative men who have sex with men, 20 of them, 10 in each condition, randomly assigned. And then on the left side over here, we look to see what happened in terms of the percent of visits attended for twice a week monitoring versus three times a week monitoring in terms of the percent of visits attended uh, percent methamphetamine in urine samples and the percent showing uh, metabolite of, of tenofovir, the PrEP medication in urine samples. And you can see here that the twice a week should perform better for the tenofovir as PrEP compared to the methamphetamine reduction compared, uh, compared to thrice weekly. On this side over here, he shifted and provided the analysis of looking at if you incentivize 10 of the men for methamphetamine negative versus tenofovir positive incentives, you see that the methamphetamine monitoring looks about the same as the tenofovir monitoring in terms of number of visits attended. Um, but what we see is that what you incentivize um, drives what you see. And we would expect that. It's a, this is not a treatment-seeking group. This is just basically folks who are coming in looking to participate in research on uh, who have positive methamphetamine use, living HIV negative, and are taking antiretroviral therapy as pre-exposure prophylaxis. But really fantastic move here in terms of being able to incentive show um, significant in, or a substantial increase here in the tenofovir positive urine samples. So, so it raises this question, what is happening in terms of treatment with men who have sex with men um, and, and their response to contingency management? We see a really strong positive outcomes. These are outcomes from a, 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 a trial that we just published in the New England Journal last year about the combination of extended release naltrexone plus a high dose of bupropion um, over, um, <coughs> over over a 12 week period for these are, this is a general sample. Um, and you can see that compared to control placebo, the combination uh, across 403 participants is 11.1 percentage points. Jeremy Kidd at Columbia University said, I wonder if we could see a difference in terms of how people responded um, in the men half of the sample um, by whether they were behaviorally acting men who have sex with men or men who have sex with men and women uh, versus heterosexual men. And this is fantastic. This blew my mind here about this sort of increase of the treat average treatment effect for gay men compared to heterosexual men. So, so this is a fantastic, significant difference. And it's actually a, a better response than the overall sample. So, so of course, my mind goes to the thought about thinking, well, what if we were to integrate contingency management with a, with a medication therapy in this group? That seems to me to be a simple and important next step to follow up. And by the way, why would this happen? I have absolutely no real, real idea. I, I have some thoughts, but it's a different uh, discussion. Um, thinking about one of the things that we need to think about in the next 10 years is using CM, contingency management, as a lever to study mechanisms underlying addiction. So a couple examples. So I learned over the last year by working with um, Benicio de, de Jesus Perez and Rohan Zamanian at Stanford, that the primary, uh, that half of um, all cases of pulmonary arterial hypertension that are not genetic in the US are caused by 25% of the remaining half are, is due to methamphetamine and the other 25% is due to HIV. So one of the things we're, we're, we, we're, we're, we've put in a grant in to start to see if, what if we reduce methamphetamine before or proximal to the development of pulmonary hypertension, what, what would happen then? That's one of the questions we're asking. Shengen Lai is also doing some work with cocaine use to show what happens if you use a high, bait, high schedule uh, contingency management intervention among cocaine users with HIV and watching what happens to high risk coronary plaque regression. Um, fantastic idea showing that it, as you begin to uh, using randomization, you can show the effect of contingency management in slowing the laying down of uh, coronary plaque, uh, which is an important part of the 
um, coronary responses to, to cocaine and to methamphetamine. Um, a K award, Sheree Blair is looking to see, to study, uh, to use contingency management to study the effects of methamphetamine exposure and concomitant rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia on rectal cytokine concentrations. This is important as we talked about rectal, the gut is the area where HIV is most active. And so what she's doing is bringing people in who have active uh, rectal gonorrhea, chlamydia, and methamphetamine use and living HIV negative um, into treatment to begin testing as you pull methamphetamine on board, what happens to uh, cytokine concentrations in gut and what happens to uh, the recovery from having an active STI. Michael Lee, who's also here, is looking at a similar sort of question, but it's in the HIV positive side and is looking at pro-inflammatory gene expression with methamphetamine use and viral load in people living with HIV. These are people living with HIV who are using methamphetamine, all MSM, um, and what he's testing is whether is, is the rate at which methamphetamine use can be associated with reduced CTRA gene expression. This is an epigenetic expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines that happens with methamphetamine exposure. So the whole idea is what happens and what is the rate at which we see recovery of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine distribution in gut. So that's a lot. Contingency management has a strong signal for working in people who have sex with men. Um, and sex, men who have sex with men and men who have sex with women, particularly for reducing stimulant use. It's a great take home. We need to roll this out on a large level. Uh, already we see successful uh, CM strategies using low cost community-based uh, approaches that are implemented and paid for using public health dollars. In San Francisco, what we see is that that project prop is the front door for um, a, a gay specific treatment agency. So across the city, people know you can come in for harm reduction, but you can also, as you begin to reduce your methamphetamine use, if you want to do some treatment, the door is open and it works very nicely. Um, the potential to boost med medication effects in men who have sex with men who use meth, um, it, it needs to be done. It, it's just a study waiting to be done. Um, uh, links between methamphetamine and infectious diseases, uh, offers a unique ability to pair addiction medicine with addic infectious disease professionals, and then creativity happens. You can look at things like microbiome. You can look at gut-brain axis. We can look at all kinds of ways in which methamphetamine has direct effects on body compartments and being able to understand mechanism as that, that associates with pulling methamphetamine off the body. Um, and that scientific lever does allow study of mechanisms whether it's STIs, pulmonary arterial hypertension, epigenetic shifts, or any other number of um, systems. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Gee, thanks for that um, comprehensive and programmatic um, body of work. Thanks for sharing it with us. It was just outstanding. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so we, we have two questions here waiting for you. The first is, um, for the data on odds of social and health consequences of different frequencies of methamphetamine use, you mentioned this was from 10-year uh, cohort uh, data, but were these associations cross-sectional or were there, were there temporal precedents or you get the gist ahead? Yeah, yeah, no, this is, we, we leveraged the data. The data are collected every six months. So this is not cross-sectional data. These are, these yeah. are data leveraged through time. So yeah. we, we, this is pretty strong. In the uh, UCLA tradition, I would say these 20 year follow-ups and you know you guys do a great job and have for a long time on that. So next question, uh, we have a CM study where people virtually submit saliva samples and we sometimes struggle to get samples even when paying somewhere between two and $20 per negative sample three times a week across 12 weeks. How did these studies get any urine sample submissions at 250 per sample? Would love to know if you have tips to increase submissions. It's a different time. I don't know. I mean, I, I we're, we're working, we're getting our, so we're just basically back in clinic. I mean, Steve, we were talking about being back in office. It's like it's sure. being back in clinic. People have shifted their behavior patterns. So I think that a real testable question to see what's happening. We have Cherie and Michael's work are just getting started. In Michael's study, we've got two people um, randomized and we've got one or two people in Cherie. So, so it's like we're just starting to see what's happening. 
Um, I think partly it has to do with clinic context. So, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, if we expect people to show up and we're there and, you know, the whole team is there, then it does start to build the sense of community that pulls people back. So sure. those are potent reinforcers that are there that people need, especially post COVID, you know, that people are seeking community and, and that actually can work in your favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a question for you. I was impressed to see the studies that you're presenting towards the end, um, these multidisciplinary studies with um, internal medicine folks. Um, how did that emerge? How did you start those collaborations? Well, I think I was I was shaped by NIDA. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so it was it was like I was presenting the standard CM sort of thing, and they were saying nice science, but we're not funding it. Um, and then you know we would bring in something that had a, an infectious disease twist, and they'd go, "We'll pay for that." So right, right. so that's how that happened. But but your colleagues, how did you reach your um, internal medicine colleagues? on collaborating and you know well, this, is something the Rick, this is something rick and i have been talking about so infectious diseases is a part of internal medicine and sure. family medicine and internal medicine and infectious diseases have a history of working with folks who have serious health problems like hiv like addiction like um, homelessness so so these are the folks who are going to to work together so mm. i typically find the progressive sort of scientifically interesting sorts of folks and and I pitch this stuff and they're like that makes sense why don't we do this so okay. like, I'll do a presentation like this and one of the one of the clinic doctors will say I'm going to take a hundred dollar bill and say to George over here who's been traditionally non virally suppressed show up start taking your medications show up in a month and if you've got a one-fold reduction I'm going to give you a hundred dollars in, and and off you go and it works and it's sort of like this is nuts so yeah the, the, those guys are willing to take a risk and that leads to the creation of interesting ideas and they're competitive so so it's it's about that you got to rub those shoulders and get out there wonderful so maybe we have one last question here well actually two i'll ask him real quickly um the first the last two i'm curious regarding the loss of uh, a type of sex and how this was addressed in your treatment group. And I'll give you the other one. Um, with some epidemiological data suggesting differences between bisexual and gay men in terms of substance use behaviors and problems, I'm wondering if you've ever found any notable differences between these groups in terms of treatment effects. So the first one on type of sex and loss of it. So type of sex, so so what that hap what happens with that when we do have a talk therapy piece that goes with our work, the first session is about the homework from the first session is to get laid without using methamphetamine between now and the next time I see you. So, mm -hmm. so that actually becomes a homework thing. It's behavioral science. I mean, it's, it's application of behavioral principles. If you can't do it, it's best to do it when you're engaged in a treatment process or you have a counselor or somebody who gives a hell about you. Yeah. you know, yeah. so, so that's what you do. And, and you kind of talk about it going on. But there is no substitution for that hole in the behavior repertoire you just have to kind of pave it over with regular sex and which isn't right. that bad so so the second thing about um you know about differences between uh behavioral acting men who have sex with men only versus uh, bisexual men uh, we've not been able to see significant response differences by whether people fall out that way but what we have seen is that that behaviorally acting bisexual men tend to use more substance. Um, and so the, the CM will work, but there may be underlying things that have to be talked out, things like internalized homophobia, that those stimulants actually medicate over to be able to have a kind of sex that the person wants. So, so that, that tends to be a talk piece that people want to get to, um, but, and, and may or may not be able to resolve. But the point being that if if that to the extent that links, they'll they'll have a harder time sustaining abstinence after the contingency management program stops. Mm. Well, Steve, we're out of time now, but it's really been a wonderful lecture and Q&A session. Again, I really appreciate your time and you've really kicked this off um, 
in this series we're going to do on contingency management. So again, I want to encourage you and the audience to please join us on October 6th and 7th, where we're we're going to have two days full of uh, contingency management research and efforts towards implementation. So um, thanks to everyone. And that's it for today. Thanks, Steve. I mean, seriously, did you think when you started this thing 30 years ago that this would be going on? It's like, this is crazy. No, I did. But you, <laughs> you brought back a fond memories when you mentioned 1991 talking with you and Rick. So that, that's great stuff. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.